Of course, we're talking about GameStop in particular when it comes to the short interest moving down to 39% from about 114% in mid-January. But let's get more analysis now with uh, David Bonson, who joins us from Newport Beach, California, CIO of the Bonson Group, a wealth management firm with around $2.6 billion in AUM. David, what is your view uh, on what's been going on? Is this a short-term phenomenon or is it a symptom of changing conditions within the markets and particularly liquidity? It is completely a short-term phenomena, and it is in no way an indication of a new changing of the guard in terms of how markets work and so forth. It was really a perfect storm of circumstances that enabled this to take place. It's very hard to see how all those stars could align very often. Now, to the extent other positions could end up finding themselves with 140% of shares outstanding in the float all and short interest, I would imagine that you could always create another squeeze. But even then, I don't think it could take place the exact same way with the social media component and internet chat boards and so forth. This really was quite an idiosyncratic event. Uh, David, we spoke earlier, our colleagues, to Carson Block, famed short seller, of course. He pointed to another dynamic. You outlined a number of the dynamics at play here. He said that potentially you're seeing hedge funds, other hedge funds taking the other side of the bet and using the retail, the Reddit retail focus and noise essentially as, as a shield, as a smokescreen. Uh, take a listen to what he had to say. Effectively, what happened with GameStop, et cetera, was a democratization of this tactic. And I have wondered, especially as we were getting squeezed on, game, on um, GSX, I have wondered, like, hmm, you know, is there coordination there with these hedge funds? David, are you seeing any evidence of this? No, I'm not seeing any evidence of it, but I'm quite certain that there has been some of that. And I don't think coordination has to be an insidious term here. It's more the idea that some smart money was taking advantage of the circumstances on both sides. And there is no reason to believe that the volume and the gravity of what we saw last week was only with Robin Hood type traders. I find that a rather silly notion. So yes, the the big bad hedge funds uh, apparently in this case were both uh, the victims and the beneficiaries. And I think that's what makes a market. You have a combination of actors, different positions, different mm. tactics, and, and the world will go on. If, if, if it is what, what you say, uh, David, uh, you know, more, maybe a one-off, uh, you know, we might get a couple of, of instances, uh, similar moves here and there. You know, I bring silver up. Uh, we might get something else. Who knows? Uh, my, my question is, does, regula- does regulation then play a part? Is it supposed to play a part with people now starting to look at the loopholes here? Well, first, let me address what you said about the silver issue. I think silver ended up being up 8% today. Um, and the idea that there is a short squeeze taking place on silver when the net uh, uh, speculation in silver futures is long, I find to be really misguided. I do not believe that it is remotely comparable. And in fact, um, I, I think it's the opposite. I think that you'll have plenty of people that are coming in to play the long side of silver for fundamental reasons. The GameStop issue is completely unique in that it became overwhelmingly one-sided with leverage, with no one really paying attention to how the float had gone. Now, you did not see the same phenomena actually unwind in some of those other names with AMC and and um, the a couple others that they were sort of thinking of in that same classification last week because the market self-corrected very quickly. But when you bring up the regulatory response, I'm not trying to be hyper-libertarian about this, but I do want to be very practical for those of us who believe in the idea of markets. There was nothing illegal that's even being alleged here on either side. There was recklessness, right. and the reckless actors have paid for it and with market forces. But I believe that there's almost nothing regulators could do that would not make the problem worse. 
Kind of feels like a college party, huh? Uh, and some of the school officials coming in and not really finding anything black and white. Uh, th- that's for another conversation, David. Uh, let, let me bring in the Fed then, because they kind of distanced themselves last week from this. Uh, and they're saying extremely low rates uh, is, is not the only reason perhaps we're seeing this. Now, I, I, let me ask you a question then. You know, with stimulus coming perhaps from Biden and we might get another check, does the Fed look at this as and, and collectively these little things? Do they look at this and say, that's a reason to start looking deeper into maybe financial asset bubbles. I think that the Fed should very much be thinking about financial asset bubbles. I just don't believe a short squeeze on GameStop is the reason. Maybe high yield bond spreads at 300 basis points is a reason. You know, maybe um, housing prices Mm. making new highs at low inventories is a reason. There is uh, maybe corporate bond spreads that are practically trading in line with uh, treasuries is a reason. There's a lot of inefficiencies and a lot of distortions in capital markets that have been, I think, somewhat uh, 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 coming out of Fed policy, particularly post-COVID. I'm just simply saying the GameStop rally is small ball in the grand scheme of things. You, you margin borrowing is very cheap, but all borrowing is very cheap. So you're going to get more leverage. You're going to get more mm. activity that you otherwise wouldn't get. That's what uh, malinvestment comes from. It's a distortion in behavior that comes from the realities of easy credit. The Fed is not unaware of this. They can downplay it because they don't have a choice. They're not going to change. And so they have to downplay it because they know that the policy regiment is going to stay on because they've made a decision similar to Bernanke post GFC, similar to Greenspan a number of times 20 and 15 years ago, that in this case, the upside is more important to them than the downside. They believe it's better, all things considered, to have distortions in credit markets than to have the broader economic concerns that they're more worried about. So I happen to not agree with them, but I am very certain that that's what their mentality is, and they're quite self-aware about it. David, before we let you go, we need to get your stock picks. You like Walmart, Coca-Cola, and P&G. Is there one of those stocks that stands out for you? And if so, why? Well, I think Coca-Cola would stand out just simply because it's the most distressed on the year. It seems to have a little lower entry point for people looking to come in. Um, but Procter Gamble, I think, is always attractive. It very rarely gets ahead of itself in valuation. But in all these cases, these are not hot stock picks. These are not things that are going to blow the lights out here in the days, weeks, months to come. What they are are reasonably priced companies that have not participated in the recent rally, recent rally recovery and inflows into the consumer staple space. Even energy and financials have seen inflows pick up a lot. Consumer staples have not. So I just think that all investors are looking for value. You have that opportunity. And in this case, with three of the great names, dividend growth, low beta, and really tremendous balance sheet protection. Yep. And of course, David, it dovetails into your call. We are in early innings of this rotation into value. David, a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. I'm having.